Thank you very much, Madam Vice President, for welcoming us to this, the second annual Skoll World Forum debate here at the Oxford Union, presented by the Skoll Centre for Social Entrepreneurship. This is a great opportunity for the Skoll Centre to connect with the broader Oxford community. And for those not familiar with the Skoll Centre, we're based here in Oxford. We're embedded in the business school and we bring together social entrepreneurs developing future leaders through our programs to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges. We're here all year round, not just in the famous Skull Forum Week, so please come and get to know us. Um, we'd like to build our communities in Oxford wide, so welcome, and um, we're very honored to be here. This is an incredible place. And we're excited to present this really critical question to the House and invite six prestigious and talented individuals to present their arguments and to try and win your support. The motion for today's debate is this house believes that tech for good is a false promise. The promise of technology as the quintessentially British national treasure that is Stephen Fry describes is the biggest and most exciting bringing together of human beings giving the freedom of access to knowledge and the dissolution of boundaries the all-gifted, our millennium's Pandora, that would bring nothing but learning, understanding, friendship, unity, and comedy. He also warns, though, as the Greeks had foretold, that when you have something that seems perfect, there is no possibility, but that it also contains the opposite. Jules Joubert once said, it is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a debate without than to settle a question without debating it. Whilst we may agree with this, despite what we've witnessed in recent months in the House of Commons, we hope that today we will have a conclusive winner to this debate, and it will be the will of the people here that will adjudicate. As I say, we have six exceptional speakers. Uh, to look at the critical opportunities and threats and present their cases for your deliberation. This is an Oxford Union debate in, in true parliamentary style, so I urge you to make some noise, um, get engaged, support, stamp, shout, do whatever you want to do, um, and make your feelings well and truly known. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this, the speakers. The first speaker that will speak for the motion is Tanya O'Carroll. Tanya is leading a growing team at Amnesty Tech. She co-founded and directs Amnesty International's Global Technology and Human Rights Programme. Amnesty Tech undertakes investigations, campaigns and advocacy in relation to human rights impacts of new and frontier technologies, while simultaneously investing in and pioneering new technologies, tools and tactics to benefit the human rights movement. Welcome, Tanya. Our second speaker, is Dr. Rosaria Tadeo. She is a research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute and deputy director of the Digital Ethics Lab. Her recent work focuses mainly on the ethical analysis of cyber security practices, cyber conflicts and ethics of data science. Her area of expertise is philosophy and ethics of information and she has worked on issues concerning the philosophy of AI. Rosaria also was voted the top 50 inspiring women in tech in Italy, and in the top 100 for AI in the UK. No pressure, guys. Um, and to conclude the team that will be speaking for the motion, Sean Hinton. Sean is the Director of Economic Advancement Programme and CEO of the Soros Economic Development Fund at the Open Society Foundation. In 2007, he founded Turkish Partners to provide strategic advisory services focused on China, Mongolia, and Africa, and social and economic impact of large-scale extractive investments. Can we have a little round of applause for people? <laughs> and for the opposition bench, um, speaking against the motion, we have Shashi Bulaswar, is the founder and CEO of the Institute for Transformative Technologies, whose mission is to develop technological breakthroughs for combating global poverty and related problems. He is the lead author of a recently published study to identify the 50 most critical scientific and technological breakthroughs required for sustainable global development. 
And following him is Tom Adams. Tom is the co-founder of 60 Decibels, the social impact measurement firm established to help impact investors, foundations, social enterprises, and non-profits better understand their impact. 60 Decibels was spun out of Acumen in 2019 and helps and to help scale its approach to impact measurement called Lean Data. Tom also describes, after a very varied career that you've, you've just heard a little bit about, he wants to tell himself he's an entrepreneur, but it's slowly wake, he's slowly waking up to the fact that he's actually the much less sexy title of social accountant. <laughs> His words, not mine. And finally, we have Chi Nadi. Chi is a social entrepreneur leveraging breakthrough technologies to address economic and human development challenges in Africa. He is the founder and CEO of Sila Technologies, and Sila is an impact investment network powered by blockchain and artificial intelligence. And there, my lady, ladies and gentlemen, is the team for the opposition. Thank you, Kathy. So we will now move to the motion before the House. This House believes that tech for good is a false promise. I now look to the first speaker, Tanya O'Carroll, Amnesty Tech, to open the case for the proposition. and thank you so much for those kind introductions. I'm very honoured to be able to open the debate arguing for the motion that tech for good is indeed a false promise. But I'll begin with an admission. Uh, I too was a very dedicated disciple of the tech for good quasi-religion for many years. Um, starting back in, in 2009 when I was a sort of fresh out of, of grad school um, millennial looking at the promise of the digital revolution and inspired by this idea that yes technology really could challenge uh, existing power structures, remove the gatekeepers of the past, uh, access to information, access to knowledge and promote and empower social movements. You know the French Revolution had its famous mantra, its famous slogan of the time, Egalité, Fraternité, Liberté, but what was that next to the slogan that we had, the stirring slogan of do no evil. So I, I came out of grad school and I went in and I thought, where to begin? Lots of hackathons, code jams, uh, data dives. And as I worked up my courage, I realized it was time to, to sort of test this out. And so I um, decided that I would try and build an app for good. And so I set on down the two year journey of my life building an app for activists at risk. Um, which now rests in the, the graveyard of many apps for good of 2013, unfortunately. But that still didn't destroy my spirit, and I, in fact, to this day, remain incredibly passionate about technology, despite everything that I'm about to say next. Um, in the last year, we've been using machine learning and artificial intelligence in Amnesty's work to try and actually monitor human rights abuses from things like uh, abuse against journalists and w female journalists and politicians online, to uh, conflict settings in, in, in Darfur and in other parts of the world in Syria. We've also expanded our team, so now we have technologists in Beirut and Tunis and, and Dakar and Nairobi. So tech is clearly here. This is not about rejection of technology. So why am I on this side of the debate? Because I don't think this debate has anything to do with technology, actually. Tech can be good, tech can be bad. We can talk about it forever. Tech is just, in fact, neutral. Really, this debate is about power, politics and the current business model and economic logic that is driving the way that our world is being constructed and particularly the corporations that are currently constructing that digital world. So I first, I'm just going to unpick the, the title a bit around this idea of the promise of, of tech for good. What is central to a promise? What is the key ingredient to a promise? It's trust. You have to have trust that you will comply with your, with your promise, that you will make good on your promise. And trust is exactly what we currently cannot have at all in any way in the system. I first lost trust in 2013 when we found out that a handful of world straddling corporations of extreme uh, power and influence were wholesale handing off all of our data to some of the largest intelligence uh, agencies in the world. I then lost more and more trust in the proceeding in the subsequent years as we basically saw, rather than a withdrawal from the implications of that enormous revelation, the companies themselves actually just doubled down. They kind of 
dodged the, the, dodged the punch, which landed on, on the governments, on the NSA and GCHQ, and they doubled down on what they were doing before, and we actually started seeing even more harvesting and exploitation of our data. We saw uh, t t Samsung TV and many other TVs now that are just monitoring the, the recording the sound of people in their living rooms. We've got children's toys that are just recording the sounds of, of kids playing with each other and feeding that data back into some servers somewhere so that companies can figure out how to turn it into profit. Just last year, we saw Amazon Echo um, get into a lot of trouble when it was uh, found recording the conversation of uh, two people in a room, a couple, and sent the transcript to the people on their contacts list. And now that was seen as, oh no, what a massive mistake Amazon's made. Amazon Echo is acting exactly as it was built to act. It's built to capture that data, it's built to record your conversations, it's built to create transcripts of them, and it's built to send them back to their servers. The only difference is this, that they got caught up for it. Um, so I think that, uh, that the, next, the next big thing that really is where I kind of lost all trust <laughs> is the parable, I think, the parable of Facebook. So if you look at Mark Zuckerberg in 2010, he boldly declared privacy is dead. But he wishes that he could retract that sentence more than any. But as we've seen, the logic of, of that attitude, what has, has followed since. So a couple of years ago, we saw Facebook trying to influence um, people's emotions and moods by changing what people saw in their news feeds. One of the biggest psychosocial experiments ever done with no consent, with no respect to research ethics or any other standards. Then we saw Cambridge Analytica, 50 million people's uh, Facebook uh, profile data shared with a third party app with the explicit intention of figuring out how to psychologically profile them and influence the way they vote in one of the most divisive elections of modern times. So the way that they wanted to influence them was by seeding and sowing and, and flaming fear, division and hatred. This two months ago then we see Facebook and at this point I've got no trust left and I'm not even surprised when I see the news which is that Facebook is uh, trying to get 13 to 17 year olds to install a VPN on their phone so that they can see everything that those uh, teenagers are doing to understand the motivations of teenagers in order to figure out how to sell them things. So this is the world. I mean, it's funny, we give governments so much, so much uh, hard time for things like mass surveillance but actually... <laughs> The governments, in, in some ways, and I'm a vehement op uh, opponent of mass surveillance, the governments actually don't care who you are. But the companies do. The companies are doing something that the governments wish they could do to a far greater extent. And they are actually interested in you personally. They want to know you very, very intimately. They want to influence your mood, your emotions, your votes, and uh, what you buy. So all of this has lost my trust. But some people in this audience may still say, the promise of tech for good is not just about trust, it's also about hope. Because we can hope as change makers and social entrepreneurs and others, our hope is part of the solution. We can build a different world. And to those of you that believe that, I would just quote a very smart 16 year old who I think has recently schooled the world on the limitations and also dangers of, of hope. I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to act as if you were in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. And of course she's talking about climate change, and this is not climate change, but we are talking about extreme concentration of power and an economic logic which is driving the world in a direction in, that we have never seen before, and huge impl implications for all of our worlds. We cannot build tech for good on top of a system that is intrinsically and inherently corrupt and inherently exploitative. To do so is like trying to say, Let's all, as citizens, turn off the lights in order to solve climate change. We now know the only thing that's going to solve climate change is mass coordinated political action. And now we need to be thinking like this as change makers and entrepreneurs and people who are good at disrupting things. We need to be disrupting this flawed system. We need to be disrupting this business model. Because unless we do that, the promise of tech for good is fairly meaningless. I thank the speaker for their remarks and now I look to Shashi Boswar, Institute for Transformative Technologies. Sorry, I'm going to get his name wrong. Okay. Sorry.
look to Tom Adams' acumen to continue the case, uh, just Sorry. open the case for the opposition. Sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Well, um, the, 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 um, the House started with admitting they like tech. I'm going to therefore talk to you about how tech is by telling you how much I hate tech, which is that I actually think that smartphones might in the future be for mental health, what we now consider cigarettes for physical health. I actually think they should probably be made legal for anyone under, under the age of 18. So this isn't, we're not going to talk here about um, some sort of utopian notion of abundance that technology is going to create. Um, we are, the, the proposition against the House is going to um, talk to you and, and fully recognise that there are going to be both winners and losers from technology. Um, but what we do believe as a, as a group of, of the arguments we'll make is that the winners will outweigh the losers. Um, and that a lot of noise is made about the winners of technology being the global elites. And actually, I think the big winners of, of, of the growth of technology are going to be the most marginalised in the world. I hope to convince you of this. Um, so I think we should remain optimistic in general about our ability to harness tech for good. Um, and perhaps most importantly, and I, again, I agree with a lot, it's not really about tech, it's about power. And what's most exciting about some of the new technologies that coming on board and being used is that they have an opportunity to redraw some of the fundamental structures of power and indeed trust and that can actually turn around some of the more nefarious things we've seen with tech uh, and some of the points made by the last speaker. But look, before we get into that, let's take a step back. Right? There are three big, big challenges in the world today. First is trying to tackle global poverty. The second is avoiding calamitous environmental disaster. And the third is trying to redress growing inequality. A lot of the arguments about tech, and I believe are going to be made about tech, are mainly about the issues of inequality. And I think there will be too few arguments made about the possibilities of tech for addressing poverty and also for attacking climate change. And my, the two speakers that come on after me will talk about those two, two things. Um, and even on the matter of global inequality, and there are threats that are real that have been talked about, I think it was already a slightly one-sided view about the role of technology. What I do agree with um, is that the House is rightly going to state and has stated about issues around privacy, around trust. They're going to talk about who controls that technology and there are worries about that being concentrated in the hands of a, of a minority of tech entrepreneurs and four very, very large companies that are in our lives every day. Um, they haven't yet, but there might be some speculation that technology will continue to grow at a pace beyond societies and government's capacities to regulate that. That's, that's a potential and, and, and quite scary scary possibility. But I do believe that we as a society can respond to these issues and we're beginning to see it. We're beginning to see an awakening about technology. In particular, governments are beginning to wake up that big tech isn't this benign force. Right? People are beginning to appreciate that Google isn't just something that tells you the answers to everything you want to know. They're productizing you and I and, and that is not a benevolent activity. But they are considering things to change this. They're considering opportunities to challenge monopolistic behavior that tech firms have abused to allow them to stay as monopolies. Um, they're the green shoots of, that they are starting to put the responsibility for the burden of content, for cleaning up content back onto tech firms. They're not allowing companies to hide behind the notion that they're just a platform. And, and they're even starting to potentially work out to properly tax them, and rightly so. Those are all risks, and there are some things that are addressing that. But, I want to come on to also to, to really talk about some of the incredible benefits of technology. Um, one of these features of arguments against tech is that they'll exacerbate the trends in society. That's what we're already hearing. They're going to exacerbate power structures that are already there. They're going to make the 0.1% richer and richer and richer, and the poor are going to be left behind. And that is actually a commentary, as rightly said, about the economic system and the economic times in which we, in which we live. It's not actually a view about technology. But here is where tech plays a role. Tech can change some of these things. It really can. So consider the world of tax evasion, financial crime, and, and, um, and money laundering. It's gone hand in hand with wealth creation. It is, underpins human trafficking, drugs, and illegal arms trade. Increased digitization will reduce the opportunities for money laundering, as well as tax avoidance and evasion. The Panama Papers, but well, the Panama Papers, I mean, they weren't actually physical papers, but they might as well have been. They were locked behind a cupboard door right, in Panama. That's why they couldn't be got at. And it is true that Bitcoin has been associated with the Silk Road, but in the longer term, 
I don't believe that anyone who wants to hide their nefarious activities is going to want them on a digitized ledger that, it, that cannot be traced and is open for, for the public. Um, it's going to be much easier to keep yourself off blockchain, it's going to be much easier to keep, keep yourself off other cryptocurrencies. Because eventually, AI is going to track those financial patterns on, on, those, on those cryptocurrencies, it's going to spot where there's more likely to be nefarious activities, governments may even be able to assist, insist that they can connect individual wallets to individual people, or they're going to wait until it turns into fiat money, and then they'll be able to pick up those people that are performing all those awful things I mentioned earlier. It can also tackle financial fraud. The Cumex files that cost European banks billions in, in the last year wouldn't have been able to take place if you'd had all that data on a distributed ledger. Similarly, LIBOR couldn't have been manipulated in the same way. The recent Danske Bank scandals might have similarly have been avoided. And these things matter because all that money, all those fines, all that money laundering criminal behaviour affects us. It affects us when we have to clean up the banks. It comes out of the system and it hurts economies. Um, and, and this is exactly the issue. I mean, the point made was about trust. The great technological innovation for trust is about to become part of our daily lives, and that's Bitcoin. Oh, sorry, that's um, blockchain. That is actually not a tool for reducing transaction costs. That isn't a tool for, uh, for buying and speculating on Bitcoin. It's actually a tool for addressing issues of trust. Um, but perhaps more important than policing capitalism, there is a role for technology in a much bigger prize, and that's transforming capitalism. Um, this is Skoll, this is all about impact investing, it's all about social entrepreneurship. We all think that's really fantastic, and it's kind of normal terms, but actually, what's at the heart of impact investing is a suggestion that you can transform capitalism, that you can account not just for financial value, but actually start to account for a wider set of values around not just shareholder value, but stakeholder value. And that requires new forms of measurement of value in a capitalist system. It requires us to start thinking about measuring uh, social, environmental, stakeholder values in ways that are familiar with financial values, and tech can play an extraordinary role in, in that. Um, there is an extraordinary amount of innovation happening in the way in which impact is being measured, uh, a combination of mobile phones across the world so we can deploy research tools, the wider application of sensors, use of satellites, sentiment-based face, tone, and text analysis, coupled with distributed ledgers that will store this data. So in the not-so-distant future, something that feel, felt like it would be an impossible thing to do to accurately measure impact could, be, could happen over and over again, and we could see that social performance and social accounting is every bit as robust as financial accounting. When that happens, we can actually change the way capitalism works. We can start to insist that companies not only have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders, but they have a fiduciary duty to their customers, their employees, the environment and communities, and tech is going to underpin those radical, radical changes. Um, so if, that, if tech can do those things, it can speed up going from uh, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. It won't just be tech for good, it'll be tech for great, and sorry, that's a bit cheesy. <laughs> I thank the speaker for their remarks and now look to Rosaria Tadeo, Oxford Internet Institute, to continue the case for the proposition. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Tom. I was convinced until the end of your uh, speech, you can join our bench. You join the live <laughs> side of the force. Who else without time? Uh, I am here for an impossible challenge. I have eight minutes to make my goals and I'm a philosopher. It's not going to happen, so we're going to be here for quite a while. Uh, let me begin with a quote. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, um, we first shape our buildings, and then buildings shape us. And this is very true for architecture. Look at the way we're sitting here today. But it's also true for any other kind of technology. Technology shapes, defines the things that we can do, how we do them, and why we do these things, who we become. So it's a huge, important power a social power, an histor historical power, an anthropological power, if you wish. And this is even more so when we think about digital technologies. Uh, they are here, everywhere. They help us in choosing which book we're going to read, which movie we're going to watch, which friends we're going to talk to, uh, how we're going to go from A to B, uh, and so on and so forth. They're shaping us all the time. So this is an important element to keep in mind. The other element, uh, which is also true for any sorts of technologies that we can think about, is that 
is the one of dual use. From the wheel onward, any kind of technological device we can think of can be used in different ways from the one that the designer had figured out. And this is even more so when we think about digital technologies, for two reasons. Scale. There are more than 3 billion people online. I'm sure that there is a proportion of those who can figure out malicious uses of that technology. And because of the nature of technology, digital technology itself. Digital technologies are greasy, are malleable. You design them for one purpose, you feel that you have a very nice uh, visualization algorithm to support a breast cancer diagnosis. The day after, you have a very much uh, effective weapon of mass destruction. You didn't think about that, but it was repurposed that way. It's crucial to think about these two elements when we want to understand uh, whether technology can deliver good. Uh, it's a hard thesis to support when we think about, for example, unintended consequences. You might have all heard about uh, bias, discrimination delivered through AI. Compass was this very famous case. But when we think about AI, we also think about the displacing of human skills. We delegate machines to do tasks more and more, we forget how to do that task, so at one point the computer is not telling us anymore, or not planning, making the plane land anymore, the driver or the pilot doesn't know how to do that anymore, and if you're sitting on that plane, it's a problem. Uh, it's about displacing, for example, responsibilities. Who's responsible for the failures, the mistakes that AI might make? We might be tempted to think, well, if it's intelligent, it's also morally responsible for its own action. Not really. So, you get the gist of it. But I don't like to think that technology cannot deliver good because it's bad. That's not the point. If they make you believe that point, they are misleading you. Don't fall in that trap. Technology is not bad. Technology can do a lot of good things. Uh, AI is great at diagnosing cancer. If you mix AI and human skills to diagnose breast cancer, the error rate drops to 0.5%. It's a huge, huge conquest for civilization and health. AI can liberate us from tedious jobs. If you live in this country, we spend a lot of money, a lot of time cutting the grass, especially in this season. One day of sunlight, seven days of rain, the grass grows, and you cut and cut and cut. Never time to prune the roses or have a barbecue in the garden because you're still cutting the grass. If AI can do it for you, well, it's more time to do things you like. Uh, it's about um, dangerous jobs, for example. So AI can help us, AI is a case of technology, to become more human, to fulfill our project. How do we do that? Churchill was right. Technology shapes us. But the question then is, uh, what, we want, what is the shape that we want to have? How do we make sure that technology is used for us to become better human, to have better societies? Now, the faults into the, uh, into the title of this motion is believing, trusting that technology is going to deliver good. It's not for technology to deliver social good. It's for society to achieve social good through technology. Tom is right. Technology underpins social good. It doesn't bring it to us. It's about embedding ethical thinking into design, use, regulation of these technologies. It's about having multi-stakeholders um, approaches where we can define the trades off between the different values that are competing there. Only in this way we can achieve social good through technology, not thanks to technology. So this is my last point, and I actually managed to do it even before you ran any sorts of bell. I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And please, don't fall for the wishing for thinking. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for Brexit. It doesn't work for technology. We need to think carefully about the things we will do. Where we do. Thank you. Speaker for their remarks, and now I look to Shashi Boswar Institute. Is it still not you? <laughs> Chi Nadi, CLI Technologies, to continue the case for the opposition. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Hello? All right, everyone can hear me. Um, so, the proposition is is technology for good? Technology is usually associated with progress. And um, so the question really should be is, is progress good? But then the technology, we should really, and that we've, been, we've been touching on this, we're really asking ourselves, when we're talking about assist technology for good, for good, what we're really asking ourselves is, who's building the technology? Who's using the technology? So I would like to reframe it and ask the real question, which is, who are we? We're living in a moment where we are, have an opportunity to redefine ourselves 
and that's what technology has given us. Last week, I was in the in my homeland, the Niger Delta, and uh, where our nonprofit was cleaning up oil spills, and then our tech company was had built an app uh, using blockchain uh, to allow local contractors um, who are ex-militants to clean up the spill while local farmers, young women, came and took pictures as well. They both were sending in pictures to confirm the project was actually taking place. And as I was sitting there watching this, sitting in the most polluted, oil polluted place on the planet, the Niger Delta has had over 10,000 oil spills, the equivalence of the Exxon Valdez oil spill every single year without any cleanup. If you're sitting there and you ask those ex-militants, those ladies that are farmers, is technology for good? I was thinking about this. They would probably say, well, these are the excesses of industrial technology, the industrial revolution, but I'm sitting here using this smartphone, which is the information technology revolution, and that's helping me solve this problem because it's connecting me to someone outside of my village who supports me. So I think that their response would be, are we good? Because the reason why they're in that situation is not because of technology, it's because of how we organize ourselves, organize ourselves socially. So they would be asking, are we good, not technology? And I think that we've all, we've all sort of gotten there together on both sides of the argument. That what we're really experiencing today is a failure of social organizations. As I looked at the phone as they were taking pictures and sending them through the platform so that it could be seen by anybody in the world, I realized, I looked back and I remembered the inception moment of thinking about building this Sella platform. And it was a WhatsApp group that was started by a local organization in 2013. They connected in that, they went into every single village, they taught one person how to use a smartphone, submit an image to Facebook or WhatsApp. And here's the innovation. In that WhatsApp group was folks from Shell, folks from the oil and gas companies, folks from the government. It was a huge innovation. It shortened spill response times from months to weeks. That's, re that's reducing the amount of environmental damage by an incredible order of magnitude all because of WhatsApp. In fact, the nearby village, Bordeaux, is the only village that's ever received a settlement with an oil and gas company, with an international oil and gas company. They received $84 million, and it was because of time-stamped WhatsApp images that they won the case here in the UK. Thanks to Amnesty International and the Lee Day Law Firm. Literally, the time-stamped, and they won $84 million they were offered a few thousand dollars initially. And so we ask ourselves, technology, we, we, we fear the printing press, and then I feel like we have to ask ourselves the printing press. The printing press allowed for a proliferation of ideas. And now with the information technology revolution, we have a proliferation of information. We have all this data, there's data in the Niger Delta, that's why they got that money, right? But then we have to ask ourselves, how do we use this data? We have an opportunity with these new tools to remeasure, revalue, and redefine ourselves. Redefine how we organize ourselves socially. It's a great responsibility. We're in a liminal space right now that comes around once every 500 years. We have a question, we have an opportunity, we have a choice actually. Are we going to be Cardinal Richelieu and murder the youth of our day because we fear progress? Or, no, no, that's probably too severe. Are we going to be, are we going to be the uh, art establishment elite of Paris in 1875 when they looked at Gustave Caillebeau's painting, The Floor Scrapers? It was a painting of floor scrapers who was scraping the floor. The uh, artistic elite of uh, Paris at the time, in the salons, they rejected his work. They rejected his work because they believed that peasants or the working class should only be depicted as farmers, not as workers with their muscles showing, scraping the floor. They were defining what society was at that time. They saw his painting as vulgar, but he saw them as beautiful. And that's the opportunity, that's the moment that we're in right now. We have an opportunity to, I'll say it again, 
to redefine, remeasure, and revalue ourselves. So when I was there in that moment last week in the Niger Delta, I was actually not there by myself with my team, um, but I was also there with uh, folks from the Stanford Global Project Center and impact investors, philanthropists, that from Europe, from America, from all over the world. They were sitting in a community that 85% of Nigeria has never been into, cannot go into at all, even though 85% of the revenue in Nigeria comes from that community, from that area. So what was taking place with that group being there, we all realized, wait, everybody sitting here in this group, we all have the tools needed to solve this problem. That's the same as the WhatsApp group, a group of like-minded individual, individuals coming together using technology. That WhatsApp group had people uh, from the government, from business, who would never meet each other in real life because of culture, because of tribes, because of language. There are over 570 languages in Nigeria. Not many people know that. That's a lot. And so I want to just end with saying, as a society, we're a, we are an evolving organism. We're mutating. We're sitting in this liminal space. And if technology is a reflection of who we are, I think that this is a moment for us to take on that responsibility and I believe that we can't fear it. We have to embrace it. It's difficult. It's hard. We have to think long term. We have to think about the time next that's coming after us because we are in a time between times. So I think that this is an opportunity to look at what the constants are in life. Maybe we'll find it in collaboration and cooperation. Maybe we'll find it in nature. Maybe we'll find it in stillness and meditation. But we need to go to the constants in life so that we can understand what the truth is. Because if we understand what the truth is, we can redefine ourselves and understand how we'll be using technology. Thank you. I thank the speaker for their remarks and now open the debate up to the floor. I encourage everyone in the audience to come up to the dispatch boxes to make a two-minute floor speech. So with that, I now look for a first speaker in proposition to the motion. So just raise your hand if you'd like to speak. I would really encourage... <laughs> um, proposition? So you'd be supporting the motion that this has believes that tech for good is a false promise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like to speak in proposition of the motion? Okay, seeing none, I look for a proposition. Okay, thank you. Does that work? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the speakers. Great speeches. Um, on the uh, for the proposition. Um, I think there were a couple of really good questions asked that who are we and if we are thinking about that with technology and if technology is going to define us or if the build, we build a building and then the building shapes us. I think it, I see that exactly where the problem is because the technology and the enormous um, effect that technology had on our lives has made us now sitting here asking ourselves who are we. But we are great power of nation and people and networks and um, I guess, um, empathy and um, people's power that we can do anything, we can change anything. And rather than trying to align technology to do that for us, which I agree that technology can help but cannot be the answer, um, I think technology has made us isolated, I think it has taken responsibility and power out of our hands and we are all sitting back saying, well, technology will do it for us, why should we do anything else? Somebody should come up with an app and solve all the social problems and I am um, studying at uh, LSE, social business, and our group's discussions all ends up with an app and technology, and that will solve everything, which I don't agree. I think people's power and our networks and empathy and being together will help, and we should use technology to, um, to support it, but it cannot be the answer, and it cannot make us isolated and depressed and ask us who we are. I thank the speaker for their remarks and now look for a first speaker in opposition to the motion. Yes. <laughs> well, thank 
you to everyone for the discussion. Thank you to the Vice President. Um, I wanted to build on Chi's point that we are technology because I think fundamentally all of the benefits that we have, wealth, specialization, have come from technologies. And I, I also want to acknowledge quickly that we've been coming at this from a very anthropocentrist perspective. I think for us humans and sort of the goals that we probably all share, technology is a force for good. For the other beings on the planet, I would contend that it is not. But I'm going to suspend that opinion and come at it from an anthropocentrist perspective. So a couple of interesting studies. They've shown that without your smartphone, your IQ drops a few points in tests. Or when you, when you have a smartphone with you, your memory of images is actually decreased. And if you turn that on its head, what it really means is that we're already cyborgs. We're already extended by these pieces of technology. Whether you, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it basically means that we are, we are technology and we are only able to do the things that we do because of these technologies, because of fertilizers, which you know, enabled a population of this size, all these things. And so in that sense, I think the way to overcome our natural limitations of empathy, short-term thinking, et cetera, is through technology. And that's gonna require almost changing who we are, whether that's through I mean, this is kind of out there, but imagine pharmaceuticals that could make you more empathetic beyond your immediate circles to people in other countries. These are kind of radical concepts, but we're already there. This is sort of the direction we have to go to uh, take ourselves in a, in a positive direction. Thank you. I thank the speaker for their remarks and look for a second speaker in proposition to the motion. Um, speaker there. Thank you. I proudly wear my lapel pin and ice axe, which signifies that I did two climbing courses in the Himalayas. It's a great story. Uh, what I do know is when I'm alone on a mountain, I'm scared. It's hard. And my father reminds me, just because you love the mountains, they don't love you back. I think the human mind can be frail. Our ape brain struggles to keep up with the tools and the forces that technology gave us. We want and we romanticize this new tool to solve our problems. It's a tool. It's given to us to shift the world to a new normal. And it's really up to us how we use it and how we put humanity and technology, how we use all the forces at our disposal to imagine a new dawn. And good or bad is a matter of, as my friend Eli said, distinction. Thank you. I thank the speaker for their remarks and look for a second speaker in opposition to the motion. So I'm supporting tech, right? That's what it's about. In opposition is supporting tech. So actually, I believe tech is a tool. I think we had it on both sides. But the ownership of that tool is the most important activity and the culture of the people and the organizations who are deploying those tools. There's a term, it's a modern term, it's called fintech. And my question is, whenever has technology not been part of finance, the abacus, or is it technology? Now, right now, can I ask, who's got a pension or a savings account in one form or another? Maybe a show of hands, please. Okay, so we're all responsible because we're absentee owners. The in institutional investors in Google, we're sitting aside and enabling anything to happen. Don't be evil, isn't always the reality. So one of the issues is if you look at the provision and the utilization of your capital through your pension fund or your direct savings, that's going into both tech for good and tech for bad. Now, some things, it's very difficult. It's hard to say, is this bad or is this good or is it gonna be start, start good and move to bad or the other way around? Ultimately, I believe tech is a force for good, but only if we utilize it. Only if we utilize it to deploy capital to where it is needed in the world, 
Tech has been used to concentrate wealth into financial institutions, into speculative trading, into uh, corporations that have negative externalities. But I believe if by the power of collaboration, the power of tech, including fintech, including AI, including these tools, to get capital to where it needs to go to create healthy economies, we take away the stress. But we need also tech to enable good, not good, great governance. So people who are doing negative things with our tools can be held to account. I'm for tech with provisions. <laughs>
uh, or will it reinforce the bias and inequity in the world? The House says yes. The question today is not what Tom highlighted, whether technology can be good, whether there are some green shoots of hope, whether technology has the potential to change the world. But the question today is the promise, is the promise that technology will be good, true or false? And that question itself, this framing of good or bad, true or false, is itself a false and dangerous dichotomy. Technology is no more good or bad than a hammer is good or bad. It depends if you're a nail or a head. What matters is how that technology is being used and who makes the decisions about how it will be done so. Melvin Kranzberg framed the first law of technology. The technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. It is important today that we examine how and why we should think about technology and how we should balance our optimism and enthusiasm with caution and concern. Let me start with another parable, the parable of horse manure. Many of you are familiar with the, da with the, with the dangers of technological solutionism, how the, our belief in the promise of technology can undermine our efforts to address deep-rooted societal problems. Don't panic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy promises us technology will solve everything. The book Super Freakonomics outlined in the latest of a number of uh, places that outlined the problem of horse manure in London or in New York, that there was a deep concern that very soon, at the turn of the century, the turn of the previous century, these cities would be buried in horse manure because of the prevalence of horses and carts. But hey presto, the emergence of the technology of, of the internal combustion engine, the emergence of, of, of other technologies, meant that within years, this foolish and false concern was laid to rest. And hey presto, with the emergence of the car, all of the environmental problems facing London and New York were resolved forever and all the time. Well, it hasn't quite worked out as you appreciate. Let me touch on a couple of points that my colleagues have made. The first is that technology tends to reproduce, not upend power structures in ways that make society more opaque, sorry, in ways that make these, these problems more opaque and less resilient to change. Facebook would have us believe they had no idea of the effect of their technology on elections. And yet, wasn't it just a few years ago that they claimed responsibility and they claimed the credit for the Arab Spring? It's not that they don't understand the potential of the technology, is that they fail to understand the negative effects, nor how perfectly and predictably these platforms ultimately tend to benefit the powerful who seek to control over the powerless who hope to use these technologies to organize. Let me also touch on the economics that I think that Kim so powerfully reminded us of, the economics of technology. If the arc of the moral universe is long and tends towards justice, the economic arc of, tech, of the technological universe is short and tends towards self-interest. Women are 47% more likely to be seriously injured and 17% more likely to die in a car crash because the car crash dummies used to design the technologies in cars are male. The UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights looked into the digital by default universal credit systems in the UK and found that they were disproportionately excluding poor and old who are less tech literate. The economic model of zero cost, high scale technologies tends to a one size fits all that has a hidden politics that disadvantages the disadvantage. Let me touch on a few things that Chi brought to, to the table. The failure of social systems, he said, was the problem, not the failure of technology. This is essentially the argument that guns kill people, 
Guns, guns kill them. Guns don't kill people, people do. Now, I would say that in response to his point that we need to reimagine fundamental tenets of society in order to apply technologies, we should remember what Tom pointed out. Tom referred us to blockchain as a technology that addresses trust. Blockchain is a technology based on the premise that trust is not possible, that trust is no longer achievable in society. It says a lot about us as a society that we are drawn to a solution that absolves us of the need to address fundamental and difficult moral questions in society. And I thought it was particularly powerful that Chi gave examples of art and meditation as a solution for these issues, to which I can only thank him and agree. In conclusion, let me return to the parable of horse manure. It turns out, in a twist to the tale, that there is another problem with the story. It is, in itself, a pile of horse manure. Because an exhaustive search by the Times of London into the archives of the papers of the day found no example of any such apocalyptic uh, uh, claim that the cities would be covered in horse manure. It turns out that was fake news. It emerged in an online article in an Australian journal in 2005, was immediately replicated around the world, and became the gospel on which a book by eminent uh, economists, such as those the authors of Superfreakonomics, were to believe. The prevalence of the utopian belief that technology is a promise for good that will solve all our problems, in fact proves that while some forms of horse manure are no longer a problem, others are still all too common. We thank you. I thank the speaker for their remarks and now finally <laughs> look to Shashi Boswart Institute for Transformative Technologies to close the case for the opposition. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Friends, I'm holding something and I invite the House to tell us what it is. They cannot because their definition of technology is far too narrow. Technology is so much broader than AI and social media. And I would posit humbly that the world is larger than London. What I'm holding is a humble grain of corn. The reason I'm holding it is that for hundreds of millions of people, this and grains like this constitute pretty much the only kind of food that they can grow and eat. And if we are to solve food insecurity in the world, for every one of these, we have to magically make one more appear. How do we do that? Well. Turns out, many decades back, the world faced a similar problem. After the Second World War, as the population of the world was growing, a few scientists invented a little-known process called the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process led to two Nobel Prizes and the creation of fertilizer. If it had not been for that process, there would be half the food today in the world that there is. Now, if you think of Sub-Saharan Africa, Hundreds of millions, 300 million farmers do not have access to the Hubbard Bosch process because the factory costs $100 million to build. The promise of technology for good is a new mechanism, a 21st century mechanism for the Hubbard Bosch process. There are scientists working incredibly hard to solve that problem. It is very, very hard. They've made some progress. That is not a false promise. I'll show you something else. This is a vial of vaccine. Do you know how many people die of vaccine-preventable diseases now? Three million a year. Half of them kids. It's not because there aren't enough vaccines. In fact, there's twice as much vaccine produced as there are kids who need them. The problem is there is no refrigeration for vaccines. So much of the world doesn't have power. So much of the world does not have refrigeration. 20 years back, this was such a daunting problem. Today, Thanks to the work of so many people working for Technology for Good, the, the World Health Organization is evaluating a whole new generation of 
of inexpensive vaccine refrigerators. Not a false promise. Show you a few more things. This is truly remarkable. That little square you see has 1.1 million DNA probes. And if you insert water in it with a syringe and stick it into a reader, it identifies any of a thousand known strains of waterborne bacteria. Why is that important? Take the example of TB. Over a million and a half people die each year because of TB. And one of the things we know about TB is that the, the, the bug is getting drug resistant. Whereas in the wealthy part of the world, if you're suspected of TB, you're put through a barrage of tests. If you are poor, in my country, like India, the system you use to detect TB is from the 1800s. This was inconceivable 20 years back. Today, it's old technology. What we need this for is to identify the specific strain of TB so that you can take the right drug. Another promise kept. Now, I'll keep pulling out things. I have with me. Thank you, Sean. And with me, a little bag of malaria carrying mosquitoes. No, I, I don't have it with me. Malaria kills one child every 30 seconds. By the time I'm done, 10 children will have died. Malaria needs a vaccine. 20 years back, 30 years back, it was so difficult to even fathom the possibility of a vaccine for the, for the malaria um, parasite because it is one of the most complex forms of, of uh, living organisms. Today, as of two years back, there is a vaccine. It's not 100% effective, it's 45% effective. So many more parents can have their children alive because of that. Another promise kept. It is a beautiful day today. What's the time? 4.38. Three hours from now, it'll get dark. But in this room, it can stay bright because there is electricity here. There are a billion people in the world today who do not have access to electricity. Uh, one billion people. Exactly 30 hours back, my colleagues and I ended an excellent conversation in Delhi. Um, we had spent the last three years building technologies for solar mini grids for remote villages in India, countries like that. We just launched a project to electrify 10,000 villages, 25 million people. The, the single largest electrification event in history because of technology. Five years back, a few colleagues uh, uh, from various institutions, we released a study called the 50 Breakthrough Study. The 50 most important science and technology breakthroughs required to accomplish the sustainable development goals. Truth be told, when we started it, we were very skeptical. We did not think that the world would make any of those possible. Four years hence, eight of those are here. Two technologies a year. So by the time we get to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals deadline, so many more of these will have been accomplished. Thousands of scientists and engineers in the world are working for technology for good. I humbly ask our distinguished colleagues not to overlook that work. It'll be hard. We will not fail. And that is not a false promise. Thank you. Thank the speaker for the remarks and thank everyone who's contributed to the debate today. We will now move to a vote by acclamation. So will all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. And will all those in opposition to the motion please say no. No. Okay. The no's have it. <laughs> thank you.
coming. That, that concludes the debate. Thank <laughs> you.